two emotions come to mind uh, for me. Uh, one is anger and one is grief. Totally. I've heard you address both of them. Yeah, um, I have both of them. Yeah, okay. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I, 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 was ta I interviewed Jeffrey Keel a couple of years ago, and he said he, he gives these climate talks. So the next time I was asked to go give a talk at a conference, I compressed the science down to about 20 minutes and stopped after presenting the facts that we know about the past, present, and future. And I looked out into the audience and I said, you know, I'm, I'm really curious. I'd like to know how people are feeling right now, given what I just said. And there was dead silence, <laughs> literally dead. You could have heard a pin drop. And then uh, one brave soul uh, raised their hand. It was a woman, and it's very interesting. I've done this many, many times since that. This was years ago that I did that. It's always, the first person to raise their hand is always a woman. Okay. And he said, then it takes a while, and then somebody raises their hand, and he said, it's always a woman. You know, he yeah. has a response. Is sitting with the emotional body of so, trying to process. and okay. Yeah, so there are all these emotions that are almost unbidden when you learn about climate change and they're really basal emotions they're like at the gut level fear anger shame fearful of the future fearful of the consequences fearful that we can't get this right shame that i'm participating in this system that is degrading my son's life in the future and the climate of the future shame that i can't figure out how to buy a hybrid car right now and how to get off gasoline myself. Shame in my air travel. Anger that there's no other option for me to function in society and that we're all baked into this problem and that the problem represents this sort of disregard for the, the, this planet being a beautiful living system that sustains us and how deeply we're connected to the planet. And she said, you know, given what you just told me, I feel completely helpless. Completely helpless. What can I as an individual do given the magnitude of this? When people experience these sort of, these massive scales of information, what happens is they experience a cognitive um, break, a dissonance. They can't, because of the emotions that come into play, it's very natural that you would have a hard time then looking directly at that, the information in front of you. And once she opened up, then all, lots of hands, you know, men and women, flew up in the air. And we spent the next 20 minutes uh, just listening to one another talk about how we're feeling, uh, given the news of this. For example, if someone was to come into my house and say, hey, those Cheerios that you've been feeding your son, those Cheerios are actually poisonous to him and you've been hurting him, and he's gonna suffer long-term health consequences from eating those Cheerios. Regardless of the, the evidence of those Cheerios being dangerous, my first response to someone saying that naturally would be, no, I have not, you're wrong, my son is safe. I would experience a cognitive break in that moment of someone accusing me of hurting something that I love so deeply. The same thing happens when we think about climate change. People experience information and they say, no, 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 this can't be true. I, I, I don't want to engage in this problem. It, it's too big and I don't want to look at my contribution to this problem. And I definitely don't want to think about what my kids' lives will be in 20, 40, 60 years down the line. Certain feelings are constantly there. Uh, anytime you give this talk, if you ask this question, helplessness, hopelessness, anger, guilt, uh, sometimes dissociation. People space out. They'll say, you know, in the middle of what you were saying, I just, I can't even remember after that. You know, I sort of spaced out and so they dissociated. They literally can't. They literally can't, cannot hear you. Of course we respond like that because shame, anger, um, guilt, fear, all of those things are like some of the, the most difficult emotions that we experience as people we shunt away from them. If you go to the, uh, a, a textbook on trauma, 
and you look at the affective signatures of a trauma, be it physical or psychological, all of those reactions are there, okay? All of them. Helplessness, hopelessness, dissociation, anger, a sense of guilt. You know, it was my fault that this happened to me. We have to get some sunlight on that shame and that anger, right? And one of the ways that we do that as scientists is to say, this is really scary. And I'm scared too. And I share that with you. And I wish this wasn't so. It's absolutely normal what everyone is experiencing, given what I've just told you. This is traumatic information. This is huge, you know. And your brain is structured in a, in a way, all of our brains are structured in a way, to react to trauma and in, in these ways, okay? So there's nothing wrong with how you're feeling. And I have had people tell me after uh, the, even in the middle of the conversation, you know, I've been holding this feeling for years about this issue, and I'm, I've been very reluctant to tell anyone how I felt because I thought I was the only one feeling this. Once you have an emotion that is sort of articulated, invented, you can kind of, you can kind of rest after that and think more clearly about the information and how you actually want to respond to that information. Denial is a psychological defense to prevent the brain from being overwhelmed with tremendous affect. Okay, and a lot of that can be unconscious. They're not people aren't even aware that they're reacting that way. But all of these things can be blocks or barriers for the information that the scientist is trying to convey to the individual or to the group. So that's why these human connections are so key. Is because we can demonstrate in relationship that people's responses to climate change are completely normal and natural and they make sense. Some of my colleagues have said, I don't want to deal with the feelings, okay? Well, my response to that is, whether you deal with them or not, they're in the room, sp stated or not, people are feeling it. And it is affecting how well they're able to take in that information that you're trying to prov provide them. To try to tell them that, you know, the, the world will still be beautiful, will still be family, we'll still love each other. The institutions that we have held up as pillars of our society, those institutions can withstand this kind of change. Our communities can withstand this kind of change. Knowing that our identities as people are not on the table in this future, I think is one of the ways to build emotional resiliency around this. I then bring it back to uh, solutions, okay? I want to leave people with the sense that uh, this is not a hopeless situation, is we aren't helpless, that there are choices involved, uh, there are big choices, but you know, there are solutions that are available for us to prevent the worst consequences of climate change.